coffee. Coffee no! <laughs> Recorded live. You're listening to another episode of Freedom Fighters for America World Radio at www.freedomfightersforamerica.com. Coming up next, Al Cuppet doing his show. Al's a former action officer from the Joint Chiefs of Staff out of the Pentagon and a retired military. It's October 17, 2013. I want to welcome you to this broadcast, and uh, Al will be on momentarily, so please stand by. Freedom Fighters for America World Radio is sponsored by Freedom Fighters for America. Thanks for tuning in. After a three-week sabbatical, uh, the man of the hour is back on the fan tail and ready to uh, broadcast. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Al Cuppet. Al? Uh, Roger that, uh, Chris. I hear you loud and clear. And uh, look at my signal bars. You should be hearing me pretty good. Yes, we are. You're coming in loud and clear. Well, folks, you haven't you haven't heard me since the 19th of September. Um, finances didn't allow us to broadcast from Israel, so uh, you had to have some silent, uh, three silent weeks, I think it was. Anyhow, at least three, maybe more. But uh, we're here tonight. Got some things to tell you. Some things to reiterate so that you. Have remember recalled what's been told by the Lord would happen, and some of the things that uh, have happened in the past few weeks. Let's have a word of prayer first before we start. Thank you, Lord. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus right now to guide us and direct us. We ask you, Lord, to be with this program tonight and with the listeners. Hallelujah, Lord, be with us tonight and give us faith. Banish all fear in the name of Jesus, we ask it. In Jesus' name. We would pray tonight for Sean, this uh, pastor's son. We pray for him, Lord, in this situation. It's been a long time, Lord, but your mighty will be done in this man's life, this young man's life. He's about 40 years old, but he has the mind, oh, Lord, of about an eight-year-old. But we ask you, Lord, he's a loving soul. He loves you, and we ask you to take charge of the situation and watch over him in these troublesome days ahead. We pray for Pat, Ted, and Matt and the family up in New Hampshire. We have my son Don and his family and his situation. We plead the blood of Jesus over it. Lord, we pray for the elect and the very elect that you might spare them from the Holocaust that's coming, as well as as many Jewish friends as you can spare, Lord, as we see it coming and as we articulate it weekly at your will and by your grace. We pray for our Jewish friends in Israel, which we've seen. We pray, Lord, for Nancy and his brain problem. We pray for Brother Bob and Brother Joe, Lord, who have set forth, and Sister Elizabeth, as they have set forth the words of the living God and have guided me and directed me over the years. But Lord, we thank you for Brother Enver from South Africa. We ask you to bless him and get the New King James Bible out of his mother's hands, O oh Lord. Father, we pray for uh, the 14 Ugandans, and we give you thanks, O oh Lord, that they were singing hymns on the way to the airport. It was a glorious hour, Lord. Be with them and bless them, and bless Brother Aaron and his tour ministry, Lord, and his Mercedes tour bus that uh, he rents. Now, Lord, we put this program in your hands tonight. Bless the producer, bless, bless the listeners. Guide and direct us, Lord, to the glory of your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ of Calvary. Amen and amen. Well, folks, where do we start? Well, you know, I guess I'll just start on this old-fashioned one, but it's not old-fashioned. It's new-fashioned. You've never heard it before. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's not a head knowledge belief. That is a trusting belief where you have put your faith and hope in him, repented of your sins, and have been forgiven and now have a home in heaven awaiting you. John 3.16, King James Version. It says begotten for a reason. It must say begotten son because he's the only sired, procreated son that God ever had. If Jesus is the only son, then you and I can't be saved. Most of these Bibles say only son or unique son. No, it's only begotten, the only sired, procreated son that God the Father ever produced on the earth was his divine son 
and it was done by the Holy Ghost, and he is our Savior and the perpetuation for our sins. Now, Matthew tells us that men's hearts will fail them for things coming upon the earth, and I would suspect this last week or so that men's hearts were filling them all over. The stock market was going all over the place. Uh, They almost let the genie out of the bottle, as we would say, and when you let the genie out of the bottle, it doesn't get back in. Uh, I'm trying to think of a biblical passage. But when you've gone too far on the Lord and he turns you over to judgment, you don't get back in the model, okay? The shutdown fight was staged. They have not yet outlawed guns in the United States, and they would have had chaos had we had a debt limit ceiling if we had defaulted on the on the debt of the United States of America. It would have been something like Bob prophesied in 2007. He's going to see he's going to see it going from California to Japan. He'll see it and it'll go around the world. So it didn't melt down because they didn't have the guns collected yet, although they're working on it. And uh, I want to read to you the uh, UN Arms thing. I want to read to you again what it says. By the United Nations, it was dated 5 August, and it was updated just before that when the commission, uh, the study group was studying the civilian weapons confiscation program. They did it at 2931. They forwarded it to the right office at the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, and they dated it 5 August to restrict the distribution. But we've got a copy. This should military-grade weaponry in the hands of civilians looms ever larger in the face of global implementation of 22 Agenda Plan 21. By member nations, which the United States is one, unfortunately. In particular, the United States of America has an estimated 500 million weapons in the hands of its civilian population. This is not just a static problem. This is a massive dynamic problem for the process of confiscation, as there will be those who refuse to surrender their firearms. Well, why would they want our firearms anyhow? They want to keep their nose out of our stuff. No, they want to enslave us. They want to lock all the Jews and all the Christians up and kill every last one of them, and that's why they got to get the guns. Okay, and I believe this time they're going for the Christians first, because the devil learned last time that if you leave the Christians walking around, they can pray. If they have the right Bible, they can lock Satan up tight. Two or more gathered together in my name, the Lord will be there, and the prayer of if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. What do you think can happen if five or six are praying together? How many thousand they can put to flight? To flight, okay? So they got to get the firearms, and they got to get the Christians first, because the devil found out in World War II, with the fire of World War II, that the Christians were still praying. And of course, we had a lot of Christians in the United States praying as the war in Europe and in the Pacific progressed. Satan knows now he's got to get the praying Christians in America. Well, I tell him, he he probably knows there's not very many that are praying. There's a whole bunch of them following uh, Rick Warren and James Dobson and uh, and Charles Stanley and uh, these other preachers who are... I don't like to put Stanley in with Rick Warren, but, but Stanley, if he doesn't tell you which Bible to use, he's just as bad as Rick Warren. Get the right Bible before you plan to do anything. Get a King James authorized version. Continuing on with this letter, the conclusion of discussions by the Civilian Weapons Confiscation Study Group led to the adoption of the proposed agenda to begin the process of introducing to member nations a framework by which they can begin codification of national laws to disarm citizens and civilians within their borders through a graduated process. Now, remember, Well, Hitler went after the Jews, he did it by increments. First, he kicked them out of of any job they could have for the government. Then he made them deal with only their own stores, wouldn't let them come to public schools. And uh, slowly but surely, he put a yellow star on them, and then he said, you got to go to ghettos. And then from the ghettos, they took off 5,000 a day to the camps. So they do it incrementally, okay? And here's the incremental thing right here, a graduated process. Within the discussion framework, we have identified several problem areas that must be addressed, and they are. One, 
classification of military grade weapons to be made illegal for possession. Okay? That's these uh, so called assault weapons. Creation of programs to provide reasonable compensation for voluntary surrender of said arms. Codification of laws to begin the restricting and use of and strict licensing of concealable firearms. Codification of laws to begin the restricting and strict licensing of hunting grade firearms. You see, the Second Amendment is not about tanking and target shooting and hunting. It's about a UN takeover of your country, okay? Or a foreign takeover of your country, like Israel did. What happened to the Israelis or the Israelites? They sinned against God and went whoring after other gods. The Lord sent a foreign army several times. When they repented, well, he withdrew the army. Well, the same thing's happening here. He's sending a foreign army. Number five, codification of laws to restrict the sale of of and possession of ammunition and components to manufacture ammunition. They get that one figured out, too, see, because they're planning on shutting ammo down. It's already, as Bob said, more precious than gold. Finally, codification of laws to completely make, and they say makes any, to completely make any, and it should say make. So this guy, evidently, if he didn't use spell check, he's a foreigner, and he don't know his correct grammar, make any and all Firearms illegal to own, possess, or use outside of military and law enforcement usage. And they don't tell you that there will be no U.S. law enforcement. It's going to be foreign law enforcement and military law. Okay. Final seventh bullet is creation of a United Nations Police Task Force with specific mission of assisting member nations with the collection of weaponry from civilian hands. Well, I've read to you many times the secret police. If I got it on the back of this flyer, I could read it to you, but I'm not going to. And this whole little thing I'm reading to you is called the Disarmament Commission Civilian Weapons Confiscation Program. The uh, working the study group will submit its findings and final recommendations once we have created the codification framework for member nations for a few full review by the Office of the Secretary General. Well, they've already created the task force in the country here. Uh, it's already here. I have code, I have listed at least 27 or 30 different brands of these police, if not about 40 by now. I haven't counted in a while. The creation of this UN police task force has already been done in the USA. They've been doing it for the past 15, at least since 1988. One of the local state troopers stopped one of them. He was nasty, he had a gun, and he was a federal ID card, and he stops these nasty guys anyhow. Uh, Deputy Betty, she uh, already tried to stop one of them, turned her blue light on, and he turned his blue light on and kept on going. So it's already happening as far as the, the task force is already here. Now, they are also... I've been perking and percolating along with this UN Small Arms Treaty. This is another facet of it. And I talk, I read a letter in the paper tonight from uh, one of our very smart individuals here in the county. And it would appear that they've already, Obama has already signed the UN Small Arms Treaty. And we haven't heard a word about it unless you heard a word about it. Somebody, this gal heard a word about it. I've been gone for a while. And all we need is 60 votes in the Senate to ratify it. And then what? Well, as far as the shutdown went, they weren't going to let it go down because the arms treaty had not been ratified. The guns had not been made illegal. And uh, they didn't want the thing to crash because we're going to have chaos when the genie gets out of the bottle. And it would have been untimely for them to have this thing crash and the, the chaos come and, and the Americans still have guns in their hands or the guns will still be legal. You see, if you have a, a gun which is declared illegal, you don't dare use it. I mean, if you use it, you'll be the criminal. This has happened in England. And I'm not big on guns, okay? I'm not the gun guy. You talk to uh, uh, some of these other guys out there, Butch Paul and which Paul is one of them who's, who's somewhat anti-Semitic or he's not pro-Israel. They're big on that. 
uh, a bunch of others. But I'm just telling you what's happening in our country. Now, they, uh, they, this treaty has been signed by the president, apparently. I'm trying to find out more. I've got to call this lady up and see what she read it, because I haven't been here for three weeks, country. And every time I try to turn shortwave radio on, I was beside a fluorescent bulb and or a mercury vapor lamp. And you can't use a high-frequency radio spectrum from 3 to 30 megahertz. You can't use it beside of a fluorescent bulb or a mercury vapor lamp. We know that these uh, the secret circuits being used by the New World Order from Rome to Brussels to Washington to tell the president and previous presidents what to do. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to be rehash some of the parts about the trip to Israel. I was a co-host. I had a good deal on it because I was co-host. And don't anybody think I'm rich? I'm not. If I was rich, I could have made phone calls for those three weeks, and we could have had programs while I was gone. But that's out of, out of the budget, Okay. Uh, so many folks out there think that I'm James Dobson and I got 2,200 staffers and I'm uh, Joyce Joyce uh, Joyce uh, Joyce Myers and I got 200 staffers. Well, no, I just got one staffer, me. Well, I got three staffers, me, myself, and I. Okay, that's it. <clears throat> now FEMA has a power grid exercise scheduled for the 13th and 14th. You know about that. I brother Joe got a call from a couple of people who used to work for the dispatch for 911 calls. And the Department of Homeland Security insiders have warned them there's going to be something going down here, evidently in November. Told them to stock up, plan ahead, get ready. Now, Brother Bob warned us two years ago that there's going to be one cold winter coming, and I think he said this winter will be the time. You better have six months of cash. You can get by it or you get it straightened out. And if there's an altercation in Israel, which appears to be coming, then we couldn't help Israel if we had a power grid failure over half the country. Bob warned us a couple years ago about having six months cash and warm clothing and be set. The, uh, by the way, the weather just killed 100,000 cows out in, I think, north of South Dakota. High plains, snowstorm, four or five feet of snow, and it killed. Hang on here a second. I see something backing in here. What's the guy going here? Had uh, 100,000 head of cattle killed. Now, that's not a big dent as far as the U.S. cattle supply, but that's a shock to a whole bunch of ranchers out there. And we're going to see more of this weather, more and more and more of it, and it's not going to get better. <clears throat> now, I had uh, Brother Bob told us in June, and I rehashed this several times. I'm going through it again. Between the first of... Uh, June and the end of November, it's going to be a critical time. Brother Joe got a vision on this thing. And uh, the Lord told him, don't go to Israel in November. It will be trouble, trouble, trouble. Sister Elizabeth got the word from the Lord that seven weeks after Sukkot, 24 September, that will be the 12th day of November. Trouble coming. I've got three witnesses. Now, don't go telling everybody, oh, Al Cupper said, Al Cupper didn't say this. Al Cupper said what three people said. Use the time frame. Well, Brother Gamage warned us way back years ago of October 29th. Nothing happened until last year when Sandy hit it when it came, up, came ashore on the midnight on the 29th of October and tore the place up. 800,000 homes were destroyed. But there's another 29th of October coming. So I passed the word over there this, to Israel about this. Probably there could well be an attack in November. Well, there always rains over here. We don't attack in November. 
Well, in the Battle of the Bulge, the intelligence reports in the Ardennes Forest in Belgium, there was snow on the ground. Um, the Germans were beaten pretty badly, and uh, they kept telling Patton this stuff, and Patton said, well, they attacked twice through that place, and just because the Germans ain't supposed to be attacking, and just because it's cold and snowy, uh, that's all the more reason they will attack. So he told his staff, I want you all, he was chief of staff, was named Codman, Charles Codman. He says, Cod, I want you to tell the staffers to draw up a plan to turn 90 degrees to relieve Bastogne. The next day, the Germans attacked. Eisenhower called Patton and the generals in and said, well, Georgie, and that's what they called him, what, can you help us out? When can you think you can roll? He said, I can roll 48 hours. And Bradley says, come on, George, be more realistic. He says, I already made up the op order three days ago, and we're ready to turn on them as soon as I make the phone call from my Jeep. So uh, Patton relieved Baston and saved hundreds and thousands of American lives. And so just because it rains in Israel, I said, just because it rains in November and the tanks can't operate don't mean they're not planning on attack. We know for a fact from the Holy Spirit there's going to be a two-pronged attack on Lebanon and Syria. What all happens is another story. I'm not going into that again. But uh, I've got it plainly etched in my mind from what the Lord showed Brother Bob. And if we have a good failure at the same time, you see they're planning to pull this good failure. Remember, every time they have a an exercise, Something goes boom. I know one, there was an exercise going on in the aircraft. England, there was an exercise. Boston Marathon, there was an exercise. Oh, it's a drill, it's a drill. So people started dropping over in blood flow, and then it wasn't a drill anymore. Now, there is no reason to be afraid. I keep telling you, read your King James Bible daily. Get out of that bed and pray. I'm not fooling around with you now. I'm telling you, your your soul and your eternity and your family's eternity rests on some of the things I've been telling you. I've gone through a lot of trouble and struggle and pain and 20 years of pure chaos in my family to bring you this information. I know whereof I speak. From now to mid-November... Watch what goes on. Watch for this treaty vote or chatter somewhere here and there about the United Nations Small Arms Treaty. The Democrats will certainly try to sneak this thing through the Congress without saying a word in the press, and most of the Republicans will too, because most of them are also sold out. Now, They'll try to keep it low-key in the news. You won't hear about it. We've got to keep up. And I haven't had any Internet service now for, for a week almost. I had something went wrong with the server. I fortunately got a few things sent out today. Uh, but uh, that's as best I could do. And uh, Brother Bob has had trouble with his phone and his Internet. Now, I want to warn you. If they pass a U.N. treaty that bans firearms, you will be a criminal if you use one, whether you, they've collected them or not. So you need to do a whole bunch of praying and thinking what you're going to do. In England, they banned the guns, and the only guns that were out there were some guns that the that people had in the hunting, hunting preserves and in the hunting clubs. Those are locked up at the hunting club, shotguns. But a farmer kept a gun. Some guy broke into his house from a, with a knife and was trying to cut the farmer up. The farmer shot him with a shotgun, and the farmer was a criminal. Well, the farmer made the mistake first <laughs> uh, of saying anything about the guy he shot. Should have buried him under the, he should have buried him under the stable, and that would have been the end of it. But no, he probably called the cops, and the farmer went to jail. So you can uh, pretty well uh, see what's going to happen. If you 
I got a report from Jerry Golden. I don't know if I read it or not. But I got a uh, watchman on the wall. And the watchman on the wall, the title of it was, But Always They Lie. Same day I got that in the mail. Here comes one from Jerry Golden. Don't believe their lies. Now I'm going to read it to you. All we are hearing on the news is how Obama sent troops in, in, to enforce a no-fly zone and enforce a no-fly zone in Syria to stop Assad from using chemical weapons. The truth is Assad did not use chemical weapons on innocent civilians, as is being reported. And that's true. Jerry's right. He'd be crazy to do that. And the idea, and the area where these weapons were supposedly used, in fact, if they were used, is a part of Damascus, not under control of Assad. If you look more closely at the videos coming out, uh, we can't be sure exactly what happened out there. The truth is the so-called Islamic rebels and terrorists will do anything to bring the U.S. and Israel into the fight if they can direct them against Assad. Their goal is to take over Syria like the Muslim Brotherhood did in Egypt. The terrorists can depend on Obama, who always comes to the aid of the Islamic extremists. And that's true. Jerry's got it right. At the same time, this chemical attack is reported to have taken place. Al-Qaeda sent four rockets at the same time in northern Israel trying to draw Israel into the fight. But that didn't work. And all they got was a return serve from Israel in like manner into the terrorist area where the rockets were fired from. Israel had good intelligence and has good intelligence coming out of Syria, and it won't be fooled by the terrorists. Another thing that has become more transparent is the control of the major, major mainstream media who like Obama and are doing all they can to deceive the general public worldwide. And this is, remember, this is a globalist thing, okay? It would be hard for me to believe for a moment that they don't know the truth, but instead of the truth, they have an agenda. And that's the thing that's going on here, folks. You're not getting the truth. You're getting an agenda. The Republican women have a, have a club here. And they got a part, a little article in their paper, Democrats stuck on stupid. No, the Democrats aren't stuck on stupid. No, they're following an agenda. And to the Republican women of Madison County do not understand that there's an agenda being followed. There's a conspiracy. Not the Democrats stuck on stupid. The Democrats know exactly what they're doing. They're following the, the Obama and the secret circuit from Brussels, Belgium to the White House. The destruction is transmitted over that circuit. It's the Republicans who believe the talk show hosts. Talk show hosts give you 80% of the truth, but the 20% they don't give you is, a, is what will kill you. And that's the fact, preacher, preachers out there. That the fact is there's concentration camps. There are crematoriums, and they're already in use right now. That's the truth. That's for us here in Israel. And our wonderful Islamic Arab neighbors, we couldn't be happier to see them all kill each other. The one thing we should be aware of is that they feel necessary to kill and behead someone all the time. So it's better if they do it to each other and not us. Some think it sounds harsh and negative when I say it only means they just don't know that it means, but it only means that they don't understand the reality of these days in which we live. Jerry's not sounding harsh. He's just telling us the truth. We read in God's word, Genesis 16, 12, and he will be a wild man. He's talking about Ishmael, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Well, that's those Arab nations over there. What we see now happening in Egypt, Libya, Lebanon, Syria, give testimony to that scripture. What we see happening in other countries throughout Europe, Australia, New Zealand, USA, confirms this as the Muslims show their ugly heads with their honor killings, beheadings, and Sharia law. Here in Israel, it is obvious to those who have eyes to see. And I want to check something here. Who have eyes to see what Obama and Kerry are trying to do. To say it simply, they want to bring about the destruction of Israel, and they know a two-state nation solution will do just that. We also feel in our spirit that something as big is happening and we will not like it. Well, something is, and I'm worried about it being in November, Jerry. But more important than all the seeing and feeling is that 
we know God is with us. He will bring us, he will bring the Jews back to Israel. That his prophetic word will and shall come to pass. Obama nor the devil himself can stop or even slow down the word of God. That's right, because it's already it's forever settled in heaven, and God's acting out his word straight from heaven. And it's going to come to pass just like the Bible says. Because it's already written, and he's acting it out, okay? I also know that the, the, the Lord God will use this minute to save Jewish lives as they begin to flee out of Europe and know the way to get home to Israel. Many times I have uh, used the term smokescreen. Well, as terrible as some of the things that are happening in the Middle East, it is still important for all of us who are called by his name to keep our eyes on our salvation and the callings placed on our lives. In closing, I will say something you already know. You can't believe anything you hear or see in the mainstream media, for they are controlled, and the proof of that is how they treat Obama. And by the way, Obama is not the main player. He's just one they want us to be looking at while they hide behind their banks and in their bunkers. Obama is a puppet and one who... And one, and one you know almost nothing about. Now we are beginning to see who he represents and why. We have the peace of Jerusalem for our children over here and the idea of soldiers. We have Jerry's ministry and your part in it. And here's what the Lord said on the 30th of May. Men have devised many spurious explanations for my judgment, saith the Lord. They, just, they do this for several reasons. Sometimes they have an agenda they want to promote. Other times they want to pacify the people so that they do not cause problems. And at other times they use my judgment to blame people whom they want to destroy. But always they lie. And what was Jerry's paper called, his report? Don't believe their lies. Lying is as natural to these evil men as breathing. They do not have to give much thought to most of their lies. For lying flows from their tongues like water flows from a fountain. They have practiced lying for so long that it, it is effortless for them now. And their father teaches them, well, what they should say. Their father is the devil, of course. He puts the lies within their mouths in the same way I put my words within your mouth. He indwells his people as I indwell you. He inspires them as I inspire you. They are his creatures. You are my children. Do you understand why there is war between the two camps? Beware of the lying men in power, says the Lord, for their lies promote their agenda, and their agenda is designed to silence me and my people. Don't believe what they say to you, for they are full of lies from the father of lies. They mean to destroy you as they have destroyed America. Beware of the liars and their lies, as I send you out to speak my truth, says the Lord. To you this day, amen. I got another one here outside your door at first of June. Prepare for the future, pile up the wealth. You won't have a future. You're losing your health. Hide in your bunkers, hide in the hills. Your bunkers won't save you. My fire still kills. Pile up the silver, heap up the gold. But soon the invaders will have it to hold. That's what I told you, folks. They can see it from their aircraft that fly over your house, and they're going to have a lot, and they're going to have it. Stockpile your medicines, lay them away. The plague I am sending will kill in one day. Be threshed now, O harlot, on my threshing floor, says the judge Jesus Christ, who waits outside your door. The days of grinding, June 2nd. Let not your hearts be troubled as you go through the days ahead, says the Lord. The grim days ahead will vex and trouble all who do not keep their eyes on me and their souls at peace in me. That's why I'm telling you to get out of bed, folks, and read your Bible and pray every day early. No one can come through the days ahead unless untattered unless he is fixed securely in me. And it takes an authorized version Bible to do that in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, okay? For the days ahead will be grinding. They will be grueling and tempestuous. For the demands of daily life will tax people to the last ounce of their strength. They will fall if they try to live apart from me. It will take complete dependence on me to survive. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Learn how to depend on me 
so fully. Cast all your cares on me and trust me for every need you have. Do not wait until circumstances press you into doing this. That's why I'm telling you folks to pray now. Get up out of bed and pray now. Read your Bible now. Come to me now and learn to practice dependence on me now. Then you will be prepared to live dependent on me when all the other things have failed. Seek me and find me now, saith the Lord, for the days of grinding are just ahead. Uh, I'll check that one off. I don't want to. I don't want to read it again. But this sister, I'm going to read this in June second. Blood in the streets. I will tell you about blood in the streets, says the Lord. You have asked if it will really flow as you have seen it flowing in Turkey. Now, I don't know what happened in Turkey, uh, but there has been a lot of bloodshed over there. Uh, Turkey killed a whole bunch of Armenian Christians. Uh, They killed so many Christians over there, they dipped their fez, F-E-Z, they dipped their fez in the blood and and made it, their fezes are maroon. You see these shriners wearing these maroon fezes around, these little tapered hats. Well, the Turkey banned the wearing of fez at a Turk Mustafa Kemal Ataturk banned the wearing of the blood red fez in Turkey because it brought back the memories of 1921 when they butchered all the Christians and he banned that those from being wear worn. But the Shriners wear them, and those that is symbolic and it's actually the color of blood red that the Christians were murdered and these Turks who killed them dipped the fezes in their blood, and they, they had them, and now they've been banned. They were banned in Turkey many years ago. Okay. You have asked if it really flows. You have seen it flowing. You have remembered my word that told you that in the future your rivers will run with red with blood, and you have asked if you will see it in your land. Yes, you will see it, says the Lord. I have set you as a watchman, and the watchmen see. They hear. They grieve, for they know what is coming. Seeing and hearing what is coming are parts of your calling, and so it must be that you see and hear. Uh, I continue. I have seen the blood in the streets for years, saith the Lord. I have seen rivers of blood that flow from the bodies of the castaway unborn. Uh Uh-oh. The abortions, huh? I have seen in the spirit as the blood flowed down through the streets of, of of the monstrosity, which he calls the USA. No one saw it in the natural, for it was all done in the darkness. But I saw it, says the Lord, and I remember it. Tell your countrymen that blood will soon be spilled and to flow in your nation. Tell them that they will see the blood stand in the streets. I tell them it is a payment for their freedom to murder their children. And tell them they can find safety if they flee to me, saith the Lord. For my blood will cleanse them and give them a new life, if they will come to me in repentance, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, this is a uh, pretty tough stuff, you know. Well, I will uh, just a little bit here. June seventh, ordained to such a victory. Anything that touches my people touches me, saith the Lord. That is why I told my servant Paul that he was persecuting me when he came against my people. Whoever fights against my children is fighting against heaven, and I will not allow my children to be overcome. Yet many people think that those who suffer persecution for my namesake are overcome if they are imprisoned or killed. This is not so, says the Lord. Imprisonment and death are not fairs of faith or or fair of my power. They are acts I allow for my own reasons, and they work for the good of many. My faithful ones are never overcome. I am always the victor. If you're a born-again Christian and you die, you're promoted to heaven. So you're not overcome. We've read the last chapter of the book. We win. Those who are faithful unto death receive a crown of life that is eternal. No one who has ever gone to death for me would trade his crown of life for his earthly life. That's true. 
My martyrs consider me and what I give them as wealth immeasurable, and they gladly trade their earthly life for one that will never pass away, the one in heaven. I'm speaking to you of martyrs because many will come out of this monstrosity, the USA monstrosity he's talking about, in the days ahead. It will be a right field that produces much glory, and much of the blood that will flow will be that of my children. Set your hearts now for what is ahead. Now, let me stop here. The Lord told Brother Kyle that we're going to lose 57% of the born-again Christians in America. <laughs> the other things are here. Excuse me. 87% of Jews are going to die in this country. You might as well prepare for it. And it says here, Set your hearts for ahead and prepare my people for a glorious ending to their lives in monstrosity, in the U.S. monstrosity. For those who are deigned to such a victory will be strengthened on the whetstone, and the wine press will produce a glorious vintage. Thus saith the Lord, Amen. If you're leading a victorious life, the Lord can protect you in any situation. I'll tell you what happened in Israel. I'm going to tell you right now what happened. I was told to go back in February. Bob saw me eating a meal on the west side of, Gal- of the Lake Galilee and said, you need to go over there, Al. And the sister Ruby said, the Lord told me to tell you to go. So I made plans. And that was, a, it was actually a, it was six months. It was exactly six months from the day I made the reservations to the time I left to the very day. I got there a few days early. I stayed with a, a couple, my four-year-old daughter, a couple of days. Tour showed up, and I started shepherding these 22 pretty much uh, do-your-own-thing South Africans. Now, they were really friendly, and they were great Christians. They really were. They are the best bunch we had as far as spiritual things go. But uh, one of them brought their three-year-old daughter, and uh, Hannah. And uh, Hannah was really cute. She really liked me, and I liked her. Like She was self-propelled. She was self-propelled, <laughs> let me tell you. And... Uh, the one place her mama really held on to it was on the Jesus boat because we got on the Sea of Galilee. And we spent an hour on the Sea of Galilee, and her mama held tight to her at that time for sure. But uh, <clears throat> I told the tour guide, I said, uh, and she's a prophetess in her own right, that I'm leaving on the early morning of the 9th of October. Well, she keeps saying uh, on the morning of the 8th, she said, I'll be staying the night with uh, Israel and his wife. And I said, no, I won't. I said, it's 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, I'm going to be out to the airport at night at 9 o'clock. Did you make the reservations? Well, I made them for tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. I said, well, tomorrow night, Lord willing, I'm going to be halfway to America. Because you need to change it. She said, I made him a Jaffa gate down by the bus stop over the hill there at 9 o'clock. He go there and change it. So I went over to the desk clerk. I said, hey, call in and give me a cheroot, which is a 10 or 12 person taxi. It cost 19 bucks to go to the airport. And uh, what happened was... Uh, I got the desk clerk, and he says, okay, what's your name? And I said, name's Al. He said, what's your, what's your first name? I said, Alexander. Okay. He wrote it down. I wrote my last name. I didn't need your last name. You just need one name. Okay. He said, where do you want to pick up? I said, Jaffa Gate. He said, well, they won't come to Jaffa Gate. Well, I was thinking about the bus stop down over the hill, not the gate proper, you know. Okay. Will they come to Newgate? Yeah. Okay, good. That's a quarter mile up the hill. So I said, meet me at, I said, have them give me a new gate at 9 o'clock tonight, which was 13 hours, or no, which was, uh, yeah, 13 hours from when we were talking to them on the phone. Okay. So they booked me in at new gate. So she started to pray for all of us, and as she was praying, she stopped as she had, as Joe Akers had done in 1988 when I come back from Jimmy Swigert, and she stopped in the middle of her prayer and said, Al, the Lord would have you be 
to be careful at Jaffa Gate. Watch out at Jaffa Gate. Okay. Well, Lord, what do I do? I mean, uh, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Uh, I got my suitcase, and I'll be wandering around out there trying to look for taxi cabs. Well, the day progressed, and the most of them got on the bus and headed for the airport for an afternoon departure. I went to see a Jewish rabbi. I left my bags at Christ Church baggage room, and I went and seen a rabbi or two and a couple of Jewish my friends. And when I got back to about six in the evening, I had a little uh, English muffin and a cup of tea. And I'm sitting there in the patio of Christ Church, and up walks this guy. Hey, Al, is that you? I says, yeah. I don't know how he recognized me. I had a South African bush hat on that somebody had given me. It had South Africa on it. Somehow he recognized me. He maybe recognized my voice. And I said, is that you, Harry? He says, yeah. What you been doing? He says, well, I you get your tour group, right? He says, yeah, I'm tour, doing tour groups now. Said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to the airport at 9 o'clock. i got to walk up to uh, Newgate, you know. Oh, you don't have to go to Newgate. To the, you see that big Mercedes bus sitting there? I says, yeah. He said, that's our tour bus. We're going to the airport on that bus at 8 o'clock. You can ride along with us for free. Let me check with the bishop, just in case. We got 14 seats on that bus. I mean, we got 14 people on the bus, on the tour group, and there's 20 seats. 14 is number of deliverance, folks. Salvation deliverance. 14 pilgrims, pilgrims, as the Catholic Church would say, from Uganda. Well, he says, cancel your reservation up there and ride with me. I said, okay. So I called the guy up. I canceled the Newgate reservation. And at 8 o'clock, I'm on the bus. And by 9 o'clock, when I was supposed to be walking around in the streets of the old city looking for a taxi, I was in the airport. Good neat, huh? And I'll tell you what, folks. Those Ugandans sing the old hymns. We had a mic, and I was help lead them on a couple of songs. And we started singing the hymns out there, and it was just like back in Germany in 1970. And I'm telling you, I'd like to go to church where they go to church. Because they weren't singing garbage like we sing in our churches. They were singing the old-fashioned hymns, every last one of them, and I knew them all. I knew the words to all of them. It was a glorious experience. So, uh, anyhow... uh, here we were. I got to the airport. Whatever was going on in Newgate or Gotham Gate, I wasn't even there. I was gone an hour early. So that's how the Lord delivers, okay? He really does. Now, look at my notes here. Uh we got to watch this thing, this treaty vote, because if they try to vote this treaty in before the 15th of November, it's a good failure. If they pass this treaty thing and it gets okay by the Congress, ratified by Congress, we've got a problem. I'm not saying it's going to happen that way, but you need to pray that the Lord intervenes. Psalms 2 says, Why do the heathen rage and imagine a vain thing? They rise up against the Lord and his anointed. Cast their cords and their bands asunder, and they try to say, we're not having to do with God and Jesus Christ, and the Lord will have them in derision and vex them in his sore displeasure. Father God, we ask that you would spare the church from what's coming. Lord, they are planning, and they are planning, Father, we ask you to stop it and intervene, Lord, for those that will trust you and call upon your name daily. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just ask you to watch over the, the believers and watch over our Jewish friends. Diminish their plans, O oh God. Diminish their plans and set them back where they belong. Thank you, Jesus. We ask you to watch over them between now and the end of November in a very special way, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Well, folks, uh, Back in uh, 98 or so, Elian Gonzalez came to uh, 
Julian Gonzalez, he came to uh, he came to the United States. His mother died, getting him to freedom. He was picked up by an uncle, and the uncle had him in, under his custody. And the uh, first question of Mr. Clinton was, "Well, Mr. President, is that boy going back to Cuba?" And the president said, "I heard him. Not if I have anything to say about it, he won't." Well, now that was his gut feeling for a child. But Mr. Clinton. You have everything to say about it. You are the president of the United States. You could put a platoon of Marines around that boy day and night, and nobody would take him any place. But no, the boy was seized by a bunch of foreigners wearing Border Patrol outfits with Russian equipment, and he was taken back to Cuba. And he's a confirmed communist today at about 17 years old. So, uh, we know that someone told Clinton, you will let the boy go back, we'll send in our guys, and we'll take him back, and you just keep yourself out of the way. Obama last year and Boehner met and got a deal going for a certain amount of dollars, and the next morning, Obama up to any doubled the amount, and Boehner says, Obama moved the goalposts overnight. How did that happen? He got on that circuit, and they told him what to do the next morning. The Jesuits told him what to do. They wrote the Patriot Act. They wrote the Obamacare Act. No congressman or a bunch of congressmen wrote that thing. It wasn't written by anybody who loved the United States. It was written by our enemies, the Jesuits. Obama was told over that circuit what to do the next morning, so Boehner said, hey, you move the goalpost. Circumstantial evidence proves they're telling the man what to do. Just recently... Obama said, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take some consideration, and I'll, uh, I'll talk to my administration. As he, as he told them, he said goodbye to them as they went out the door. Wait a minute, Mr. President. You are the president. You don't have to talk to anybody. You, you just say, I will sign it this way, or I won't sign it. But no, he had to go back in and say he talked to his administration. That means he had to listen to the circuit and what they were saying for Brussels. I told you that circuit was there. Been there for a long time. And um, when Waco was raided, my buddy BC, uh, what's his nickname, was up on a range at Quantico shooting, and he asked the FBI agent in July of 93, he said, what did you do on April the 19th out of Waco? The FBI he said, my buddy was on a rescue team out there, and we didn't do that. We, we were backed off on a 49th day, and somebody came in with tanks and guns and burned that place down. The circuit told Janet Reno, you back your FBI and your BATF off. We got some guys from Partnership of Peace Troops coming in. We're going to take care of it. They did. I'm telling you, they're controlling our government and our shadow government by that circuit, telling them what to do. So this is how they're doing it. You heard of the horse's mouth, okay? The one guy who got it figured out, but had the Lord's help. Had 13 years of help and guidance from the Holy Ghost and from the Father and experience in what I'm doing. And so this is what happens. No, I'm here because I love you, not because I want to talk on your toes. And I'm trying to save your life, and I'm trying to save your soul, and I'm trying to save your family. Unfortunately, I have to do it at the expense of my own. Uh, hopefully, the Lord's going to turn that around. But uh, the last 20 years, it's been rough for me. Those things in my life that should have been the best have been the worst. And those things, which I'm doing like now, exposing this bunch of cutthroats and murderers and trying to get the church up to speed, those things should have been the most difficult of my life. Turns out that's been the best thing in my life. But having been retired and in good health, you would have thought would have been the best part of my life. No, it hadn't worked out that way. Those things weren't the best. Those have been the worst. 
That, that part of it's been the worst. Thanks to a, a church and a bunch of stiff-necked and uncircumcised bunch. Uh, the Lord's going to change all that. How soon? I don't know. I, I covet your prayers, and I regret that I wasn't here to talk to you the last three weeks. But I did a lot of other things over there that uh, were really neat. Two great things happened. I had a roommate. I said, what you got for a Bible, boy? And by the way, I had another roommate in 2007 who was 33, and this one was 33 also. Uh, you got a, what kind of Bible is that? And I said, let me show you something. And I showed him his Bible. I took him about five minutes, and he said, let me get a new Bible. First thing in the morning, we're going up to the bookstore, Joppa Gate, Church, Christ Church Bookshop. And get a brand new Bible. So uh, he did. He went up and got a brand new Bible. And uh, said, "Don't you ever look at? Don't you ever put any faith in this Bible again? Never put any faith in this Bible again. Do not put any faith in this Bible. You decide to keep it. You only look at it to see where it's wrong. Don't you dare look into it. To try to find some truth." There is no truth in it except where it matches the King James. And so that's, uh, he was a confirmed believer in what I told him. Your life will change now. You're not married. You were a policeman for 10 years. You understand discipline. All you got to do now is just uh, read your Bible and pray, and the Lord will guide you, and your life will turn around completely. From what it was when you're reading that old that phony Bible you're reading. So <clears throat> that's what he's doing right now. He's reading the new Bible. He's throwing the old one out. His mother was uh, rather flaky. But she's got the wrong Bible. And you can tell when a person's got the wrong Bible, they act, they act, they act strange compared to what the church was many years back. And I can tell when a person's reading the wrong Bible. I can tell. I can tell how they act and how they are. And uh, one of our members got lost at the wailing wall, and her husband let her, wasn't watching, and we had to go find her. She left her Bible at the guard shack over there because we were going on Temple Mount. You can't take a Bible up there. She said, if I could go over and help her get her Bible back. And I said, a new King James Bible? Yeah. I said, well, that Bible's no worth not going over there for. Well, it's got my daughter's picture in it. I said, okay, we'll go for that. Got over there and the place was closed. Couldn't get it. She had to go back the next day. I said, that Bible's not worth going back for. And uh, I really do a disservice to go back over there and waste time trying to get it. And she told me they really respect me here and there and the other about things I was telling them. I said, well, you said you respect me, but... You better not be reading that Bible anymore. It's a piece of trash, and I can show you in five minutes it's a piece of trash. But anyhow, they're on their way back. They're back in India now, and uh, uh, hopefully they'll understand what I told them. I had two hours to talk to them on the bus as we were driving. I said, I only passed this way one time for you. This is your hour of visitation. I've got two flyers here. I'm passing them out. I'll give you my business card. You have time to uh, read what I'm passing out, and you better find out what's going on, because once it happens in America, it's coming to your country. And it's coming to your country. America must go down first. And so that's how it's going to go. America has to be taken down first. We are the bastion of freedom. We used to be. We're now the bastion bastion of perversion for the most part. Between homosexuality and porno and abortion and witchcraft and pedophilia, uh, we have a whole... uh, Hang on a second here. We see what's going on. Nothing, it's nothing happening, folks. Just hang on. 
But anyhow, uh, we're coming down to the end of the program here. And uh, I just want you to know that I love you. I'm here because I care about you. I'm here because the Lord sent me. And for the last four years, I've been on this Freedom Fighters for America. I want you to support this network. About the only way you can do that is to write me a letter. And uh, you write a letter. Uh, I will tell you how to support the producer and the program. That's how how uh, how upset things have become. Things are tough for just about everybody. And so uh, <clears throat> with that, I'm going to say a prayer and let you go and for next week, okay? You get out of, that, out of that bed and read your King James Bible, faith will spring up in your spirit, and you won't be afraid. I mean, you don't have the black chopper zooming over your house like I do. I'm sure you don't have the magnetometers, the infrared, and the radar sweeps going over your house continually. I had two two surveillance planes over today. I mock them. I'm not afraid of them. The Lord God Almighty reigns, and He is a His angel of the Lord and campeth round about, and I'm not afraid of them. Besides that, they mess with me. If they kill me, I get promoted. But they better be prepared to meet the angel of the Lord because He is definitely around about. So uh, with that, I'm going to say you know, a prayer and let you all go. Father, I ask you to watch over my audience, your audience, Lord, not my audience. Say your audience, Lord. They're your folks. I'm just here temporarily. Father, bless them and keep them. Bless my producer. That's all that he does. And bless those out there who read their Bible and pray. Lord, that they'll come to faith, those that aren't saved, that they'll come to faith in you. And we'll see the names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. And we'll say good night in the name of Jesus. Amishrochai, Tamid, Shalom, Shalom. See you next week, folks. Thanks, Al. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Cuppet on Freedom Fighters for America World Radio. We want to thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. And please uh, stay tuned for additional broadcasts uh, coming up in the very near future. Freedom Fighters for America World Radio is sponsored by Freedom Fighters for America at www.freedomfightersforamerica.com. Thank you.